The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, chapters 25 to 28. There are, of course, many problems connected with life, of which some of the most popular are, why are people born? Why do they die? Why do they want to spend so much of the intervening time wearing digital watches? Many, many millions of years ago, a race of hyper-intelligent pan-dimensional beings, whose physical manifestation in their own pan-dimensional universe is not dissimilar to our own. They got so fed up with the constant bickering about the meaning of life, which used to interrupt their favourite pastime of Brockian ultra-cricket, a curious game which involved suddenly hitting people for no readily apparent reason, and then running away. That they decided to sit down and solve their problems once and for all. And to this end, they built themselves a stupendous supercomputer, which was so amazingly intelligent that even before its data banks had been connected up, it had started from, I think, therefore I am, and got as far as deducing the existence of rice pudding and income tax before anyone managed to turn it off. It was the size of a small city. Its main console was installed in a specially designed executive office, mounted on an enormous executive desk of finest ultra-mahogany, topped with rich ultra-red leather. The dark carpeting was discreetly sumptuous, exotic pot plants and tastefully engraved prints of the principal computer programmers and their families were deployed liberally around the room, and stately windows looked out upon a tree-lined public square. On the day of the great turning on, two soberly dressed programmers with briefcases arrived and were shown discreetly into the office. They were aware that this day they would represent their entire race in its greatest moment. They conducted themselves calmly and quietly as they seated themselves differentially before the desk, opened their briefcases and took out their leather-bound notebooks. Their names were Lunkwill and Fook. For a few moments they sat in respectful silence. Then, after exchanging a quiet glance with Fook, Lunkwill leaned forward and touched a small black panel. The subtlest of hums indicated the massive computer was now in total active mode. After a pause it spoke to them in a voice rich, resonant and deep. It said, What is this great task for which I, deep thought, the second greatest computer in the universe of time and space, have been called into existence? Lunkwell and Fook glanced at each other in surprise. Um, your task, oh computer, began Fook. No, uh, wait a minute, this isn't right, said Lunkwell worried. We distinctly designed this computer to be the greatest one ever, and we're not going to make do with the second best, Deep thought. He addressed the computer. Are you not as we designed you to be, the greatest, most powerful computer in all time? I describe myself as the second greatest, and such I am, intoned Deep thought. Another worried Look passed between the two programmers. Lunkwill cleared his throat. <coughs> well, there must be uh, some mistake. Are you not a greater computer than the milliard garganchi brain at Maximegalon, which can count all the atoms in a star in a millisecond? The milliard garganchi brain, said Deep Thought with unconcealed contempt. A mere abacus, mention it not. And are you not, said Fook, leaning anxiously forward, 
a greater analyst than the Googleplex star thinker in the seventh galaxy of light, and the ingenuity which can calculate the trajectory of every single dust particle throughout a five-week Danga Bad Beta Sand Blizzard? A five-week sand blizzard, said Deep Thought, haughtily. You ask this of me, who have contemplated the very vectors of atoms in the Big Bang itself? Molests me not with this pocket calculator stuff. The two programmers sat in uncomfortable silence for a moment. Then Lunkwell leaned forward again. But are you not a more fiendish disputant than the great hyperlobic, omnicognant neutron wrangler of Saronicus Twelve? The magic and indefigitable? The great hyperlobic, omnicognate neutron wrangler, said Deep Thought, thoroughly rolling the R's, could talk all four legs off an Acturian megadonkey, but only I could persuade it to go for a walk afterwards. Then what is the problem? asked Fook. There is no problem, said Deep Thought with magnificent ringing tones. I am simply the second greatest computer in the universe of space and time. But the second, as insisted Lunquil. Why do you keep saying the second? Surely you're not thinking of the multi-corticoid Perscitron Titan Muller, are you? Or Pondermatic or the... Contemptuous lights flashed across the computer's console. I spare not a single unit of thought to, on these cybernetic simpletons, he boomed. I speak none but the computer that is to come after me. Fook was losing patience. He pushed his notebook aside and muttered. I think this is getting needlessly messianic. You know nothing of future time, pronounced Deep Thought, and yet in my teeming circuitry I can navigate the infinite delta streams of future probability and see that there must one day become a computer whose merest operational parameters I am not worthy to calculate, but which it will be my fate eventually to design. Fook sighed heavily and glanced across to Lunkwell. Can we get on and ask the question? he said. Lunkwell motioned him to wait. What computer is this of which you speak? he asked. I will speak of it no further in this present time, said Deep Thought. Now, ask what else of me you will that I may function. Speak. They shrugged at each other. Fook composed himself. Oh, deep th thought computer, the task we have designed for you to perform is this. We want you to tell us the answer. The answer? The answer to what? Life? urged Fook. The universe, said Lunkwell. Everything, they said in chorus. Deep Thought paused for a moment's reflection. Tricky, he said finally. But can you do it? Again, a significant pause. Yes, I can do it. There is an answer, said Fook with breathless excitement. A simple answer? added Lunkwell. Yes, said Deep Thought. Life, the universe, and everything, there is an answer, but I'll have to think about it. A sudden commotion destroyed the moment. The door flew open, and two angry men, wearing coarse faded blue robes and belts of the Crookswind University, burst into the room.
thrusting aside the ineffectual flunkies who tried to bar their way. Oh, we demand admission, shouted the younger of the two men, elbowing a pretty young secretary in the throat. Come on, shouted the older one. You can't keep us out. He pushed the junior programmer back through the door. We demand you can't keep us out, bawled the younger one, though he was now firmly inside the room and no further attempts were being made to stop him. Who are you? said Lunkwill, rising angrily from his seat. What do you want? I am Magic Thighs, announced the older one. And I demand that I am Vroom Fondle, shouted the younger one. Magic Thighs turned on Vroom Fondle. It's all right. You don't have to demand that. All right, bawled Vroom Fondle, banging on a nearby desk. I am Vroom Fondle. That is not a demand. That is a solid fact. What we demand is solid facts. No, we don't, exclaimed Magic Thighs in irritation. That's precisely what we don't demand. Scarcely pausing for breath, Vroom Fondle shouted, We don't demand solid facts. What we, we demand is total absence of solid facts. And I demand that I may or may not be Vroom Fondle. But who the devil are you? exclaimed outraged Fook. We said Magic Thighs, are philosophers. Though we may not be, said Vroom Fondle, waving a warning finger at the programmers. Yes, we are, insisted Magic Thighs. We are quite definitely here as representatives of the amalgamated union of philosophers, sages, luminaries, and other thinking persons. And we want this machine off. And we want it off now. And what's the problem, said Lunkwell. I'll tell you what the problem is, mate. It's demarcation. That's the problem. We demand that demarcation may or may not be the problem. You just let the machines get on with the adding up and we'll take care of the eternal verities. Thank you very much. You want to check your legal position, mate? You do. Under the law, the quest for the ultimate truth is quite clearly the inalienable prerogative of your working thinkers. Any bloody machine that actually goes and finds it, and we're straight out of a job, aren't we? I mean, what's the use of sitting up half the night arguing that there may or may not be a god if this machine only goes and gives you his bleeding phone number in the next morning? That's right. We demand rigidly defined areas of doubt and uncertainty. Suddenly, a centaurian voice boomed across the room. Might I make an observation at this point? inquired Deep Thought. We'll go on strike, yelled Voom Frondle. Yeah, that's right. You'll have a national philosopher's strike on your hands. The hum level in the room suddenly increased as several ancillary base drive units mounted in the sedately carved and varnished cabinet speakers around the room cut in and to give Deep Thought thought's voice a little more power. All I wanted to say is that my circus are now irrevocably committed to calculating the answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe and everything. He paused and satisfied himself that he had now had everyone's attention before continuing more quietly. But the program will take me a little while to run. Fook glanced impatiently at his watch. How long? Seven and a half million years, said Deep Thought. Lunkwill and Fook blinked at each other. Seven and a half million years? They cried in chorus. Yes, declaimed Deep Thought. I said I'd have to think about it, didn't I? And it occurs to me that running a programme like this is bound to create an enormous amount of popular publicity for the whole area of philosophy in general. <clears throat> Everyone's going to have their own theories about what answer I'm eventually going to come up with. And who better to capitalise on that media market than yourselves? So long as you can keep disagreeing with each other violently enough and slagging each other off 
in the popular press. So long as you have clever agents, you can keep yourselves on the gravy train for life. How does that sound? The two philosophers gaped at him. Bloody hell! Now, that is what I call thinking. Here, Wimfrondel, why do we never think of things like that? I don't know, said Wimfrondel. I think our brains must be too highly trained, magic thighs. So saying, they turned on their heels and walked out of the door and on to a lifestyle beyond their wildest dreams. Chapter 26 Yes, yes, very salutary, said Arthur, after Slightly Barthast had related the salient points of this story to him. But I don't understand. What all this has got to do with the earth and the mice and things? Yeah, well, that's just the first... Half of the story, Earthman, said the old man. If you would care to discover what happened seven and a half million years later on the great day of the answer, uh, allow me to invite you to my uh, study where you can experience the events for yourself on our sensor tape records. That is, unless you would care to take a quick stroll on the surface of the new Earth, it's only half completed, I'm afraid. Uh, we haven't finished uh, burying the artificial dinosaur skeletons in the crust yet, and then we have the tertiary and uh, quaternary periods of the uh, Cenozoic area to lay down. And uh, oh, uh, no, thank you," said Arthur. It, it, it wouldn't quite be the same. No, uh, it wouldn't be. And he turned to the air, air car, and headed back towards the mind-numbing wall. Chapter 27 Slarty Bartfast's study was a total mess, like the results of an explosion in a public library. The old man frowned as they stepped in. Uh, terribly unfortunate, a diode blew in one of our life support computers, and uh, when we tried to survive, our Cleaning staff, we'd have been dead for nearly 30,000 years. <laughs> Who's going to clear away the bodies? That's what I want to know. And why don't you um, sit down over there? Uh, let me plug you in. He gestured Arthur towards a chair which looked as if it had been made out of a rib cage of a stegosaurus. That was made out of a rib cage of a stegosaurus, explained the old man as he pottered about fishing bits of wire from under tottering piles of paper and drawing instruments. Here, yeah. oh, hold these. And he passed a couple of striped wire ends to Arthur. And the instant he took hold of them, a bird flew straight through him. He was suspended in mid-air, totally invisible to himself. Beneath him was a pretty tree-lined city square, and all around it, as far as the eye could see, were white concrete buildings of airy, spacious design, but somewhat worse for wear. Many were cracked and stained with rain. Today, however, the sun was shining. A breeze danced lightly through the trees. And the odd sensation that all the buildings were quietly humming was probably caused by the fact that the square and all the streets around it were thronged with cheerful, excited people. Somewhere a band was playing, brightly coloured flags were fluttering in the breeze, and the spirit of carnival was in the air. Arthur felt extraordinarily lonely stuck up in the air above it all without so much as a body to his name, but before he had time to reflect on this, a voice rang out across the square and called for everybody's attention. A man standing on a brightly dressed dais before the building, which clearly dominated the square, was addressing the crowd over a tannoy. O oh, people who wait in the shadow of deep thought, honoured descendants of Voom Fondle and Magic Thighs, 
the greatest and most truly interesting pundits the universe has ever known. The time of waiting is over. Wild cheers broke out amongst the crowd. Flags, streamers and wolf whistles sailed through the air. The narrower streets looked rather like centipedes rolled over on their backs and frantically waving their legs in the air. Seven and a half million years our race has waited for this great and hopeful enlightening day, cried the cheerleader. The day of the answer! Hurrahs burst from the ecstatic crowd. Never again, never again will we wake up in the morning and think, who am I? What is my purpose in life? Does it really, cosmically speaking, matter if I don't get up and go to work? For today, we will finally learn once and for all the plain and simple answer to all these nagging little problems of life, the universe and everything. As the crowd erupted once again, Arthur found himself gliding through the air and down towards one of the large stately windows on the first floor of the building behind the dais from which the speaker was addressing the crowd. He experienced a moment's panic as he sailed straight towards the window, which passed when a second or so later he found he had gone right through the solid glass without apparently touching it. No one in the room remarked upon his peculiar arrival, which is hardly surprising, as he wasn't there. He began to realise that the whole experience was merely a recorded projection, which knocked six-track 70mm into a cocked hat. The room was much as slightly about fast I'd described it. In seven and a half million years, it had been well looked after and cleaned regularly every century or so. The ultra-mahogany desk was worn at the edges, the carpet a little faded now, but the large computer terminal sat sparkling glory on the desk's leather top, as bright as if it had been constructed yesterday. Two severely dressed men sat respectfully before the terminal and waited. The time is nearly upon us, said one, and Arthur was surprised to see a word suddenly materialise in thin air just by the man's neck. The word was Loonqual, and it flashed a couple of times then disappeared again. Before Arthur was able to assimilate this, the other man spoke and the word Fooch appeared by his neck. 75,000 generations ago, our ancestors set this programme in motion. The second man said, and in all that time, we will be the first to hear the computer speak. An awesome prospect, Pushu, agreed the first man, and Arthur suddenly realised he was watching a recording with subtitles. We are the ones who will hear, said Fouche, the answer to the great question of life, the universe and everything. Shh, said Lun. Paul, with a slight just, I think deep thought, is preparing to speak. There was a moment's expectant pause, whilst panels slowly came to life on the front of the console. Lights flashed on and off experimentally and settled down into a business-like pattern. A soft low hum came from the communication channel. Good morning said Deep Thought at last. Um, oh, uh, good, good morning, oh, oh Deep Thought, said Loon Qual, nervously. Do you have, um, that is, an answer for you? Interrupted Deep Thought majestically. Yes, I have. The two men shivered with expectancy. Their waiting had not been in vain. There really is one, breathed Push. There really is one, confirmed Deep Thought. To everything? The great question of life, the universe and everything? Yes. Both men had been trained for this moment. Their lives had been a preparation for it. They had been selected at birth 
as those who had witnessed the answer. But even so, they found themselves gasping and squirming like excited children. And are you ready to give it to, it to us? urged Lin Kuo. I am. Now? Now, said Deep Thought. They both licked their dry lips. Though I don't think that you're going to like it. It doesn't matter, said Pooch. We must know it. Now. Now? inquired Deep Thought. Yes, now. All right, said the computer, and settled into silence again. The two men fidgeted. The tension was unbearable. You're really not going to like it, observed Deep Thought. Tell us. All right. The answer to the great question? Yes. Of life, the universe, and everything? Yes. Is? Yes. Is? Yes. Forty-two, said Deep Thought, with infinite majest and calm. Chapter 28 It was a long time before anyone spoke. Out of the corner of his eye, Pooch could see the sea of tense, expectant faces down in the square outside. We're going to get lynched, aren't we? He whispered. It was a tough assignment, said Deep Thought mildly. Forty-two, yelled Loon Quall. Is that all you've got to show for seven and a half million years' work? I checked it very thoroughly, and that quite definitely is the answer. I think the problem, to be quite honest with you, is that you never actually known what the question is. But it was the great question, the ultimate question of life, the universe and everything. Yes, said Deep Thought with an air of one who suffers fools gladly. But what actually is it? A slow, stupefied silence crept over the men as they stared at the computer and then at each other. Well, you know, it's just, that's just everything, everything you know. Exactly. So once you do know what the question actually is, you'll know what the answer means. Oh, terrific, said Poosh, flinging aside his notebook and wiping away a tiny tear. Look, look, all right, all right, all right, said Lil Kwan. Can he just... Please tell us the question. The ultimate question? Yes. Of life, universe and everything? Yes. Deep Thought pondered for a moment. Tricky. But can you do it? cried Lin Kuo. Deep Thought pondered this for another long moment. Finally. No, he said firmly. Both men collapsed into their chairs in despair. But I can tell you who can, said Deep Thought, and they both looked up sharply. Who? Tell us! Suddenly Arthur began to feel his apparent non-existent scalp being, begin to crawl as he found himself moving slowly but inexorably towards the console, but it was only a dramatic zoom on part of whoever had made the recording, he assumed. I speak none but the computer that is to come after me, intoned Deep Thought, his voice regaining its accustomed declamatory tones. A computer whose merest operational parameters I am not worthy to calculate, and yet I will design it for you. A computer which can calculate the question to the ultimate answer. A computer of such infinite and subtle complexity that organic life itself shall form part of its operational matrix. And you, yourselves, shall take on new forms and go down into the computer 
to navigate its 10 million year program. Yes, I shall design this computer for you, and I shall name it also unto you, and it shall be called the Earth. Fooch gaped a deep thought. Oh, what a dull name, he said, and great incisions appeared down the length of his body. Loon Qual too suddenly sustained horrific gashes from nowhere. The computer console blotched and cracked, the walls flickered and crumbled, and the room crashed upwards into its own ceiling. Slarty Bartfast was standing in front of Arthur, holding the two wires. Oh, <laughs> end of tape, he explained. <laughs>